Friends, my name is Nizamuddin Ahmed Siddiqui and I am Assistant Professor of Law at West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata. The present module entitled Detention, Torture and Rights of Prisoners of War, which is part 2 of what we have discussed earlier, focusing on Guantanamo and Abu Gharib case studies. The learning objectives of the present module include, number 1, to give students an overview of the necessity of media in a conflict and number two, to acquaint students with an understanding of international human rights law on media. Let us begin with the prohibition of torture, which is an absolute use cogens norms recognized by all the constitutions, laws and treaties of the international community and from which no derogation is allowed. The UN Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment of Punishment 1985 states that torture is any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person for such purpose as obtaining from him or a third person information or a confession. The Geneva Convention of 1949 and their additional protocols of 1977 prohibit humiliation and degradation of prisoners of war. Torture is considered to be a crime against humanity, committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population with knowledge of the attack, as is presented in Rome Statute Article 7. It also states that perpetrators may be prosecuted for war crimes under the Rome Statute of 2002. Prohibition of torture and inhuman treatment are included in several international agreements ratified by countries across the world including United States as well as the constitutions of the countries again including the laws of United States of America. Friends, let us now turn to Guantanamo Bay Prison. The Guantanamo Bay Prison Detention Camp is a United States military prison established in 2002. Detainees captured in the war on terror, most of them from Afghanistan and much smaller numbers later from Iraq, the Horn, or, Horn of Africa and South Asia were transported to the prison. The lawyers of the U.S. Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice argued that the Third Geneva Convention did not apply to members of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban captured in the war in Afghanistan or other locations. Ensuing U.S. Supreme Court decisions since 2004 have determined otherwise and that the courts have jurisdiction. It has ruled in Hamdan versus Rumsfeld on 29th of June 2006 that detainees were entitled to the minimal protections listed under Common Article 3 of the Geneva Convention. Following this, on 7th of July 2006, the Department of Defense issued an internal memo stating that, that prisoners would in future be entitled to protection under Common Article 3. The camp held the detainees for interrogation. Since January 2002, 779 men have been brought to Guantanamo. The aim was to be able to interrogate them for indefinite period of time and far away from civilian courts. Both the camps in Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib used similar techniques for interrogations. Friends, let us now examine the torture techniques, which included the physical and psychological techniques. Operating under varying rules and with different goals and guidelines, the institution repeatedly clashed over their disparate views of acceptable and effective interrogation techniques. New enhanced programs were designed for interrogations which were officially approved. Psychological abuse such as light and sound manipulation, solitary confinement, exposure and temperature extremes, sleep deprivation threatened with 
transfer to another country for torture were the common examples of the techniques that were used. Based on official US government statements that have not been independently verified, in 2003 alone there were 350 acts of self-harm including 120 hanging gestures. Some of the prisoners have reported of being confined in solitary for long periods even in the excess of one year. A prisoner was made to live under fluorescent light for three years, causing pain to his eyes and dizziness. Cells were often kept in extreme hot or cold. Physical abuse included short sackling, stress positions and immediate reaction force. Even doctors and psychologists have been actively involved in abusing the prisoners for interrogations. Additional behavioral science consultation team was also involved. Medical care was withheld or unnecessary medical procedures were carried out on the prisoner. Alarming number of sexual abuse incidences were carried out by the interrogators. The prisoners were sexually degraded and humiliated. Sexual provocation by female interrogators was carried out in exchange for information. The prisoners were subjected to religious humiliations and cultural abuses too. Their religious practices were interfered by their guards. For instance, the prisoners were frequently shaved off. The guards degraded the prisoners and treated them inhumanely. For instance, the soldiers urinated on and burned the prisoners with cigarettes. The prisoners were also made to walk barefoot on broken glass. Hot liquid was poured on their heads and electric shocks were given to the prisoners. They were routinely beaten up by the guards at night. A legal memo of August 2002 opined that abuse does not rise to the level of torture under US law unless such abuse inflicts pain equivalent in intensity to the pain accompanying serious physical injury such as organ failure, impairment of bodily function or even death. Mental torture required in this legally dubious view suffering not just at the moment of infliction but lasting psychological harm such as seen in mental disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder. By late 2002, different branches of official military began to question these methods of interrogations and expressed their concerns. Despite consistent concerns, the head authorities issued isolation for a month at a time 24-hour interrogation and exploitation of individual phobias to induce stress. Interrogators were also instructed to deprive the prisoners of light and auditory stimuli, forcibly strip them naked, hood them and subject them to stress positions. Let us now examine the legal issues involved. The detainees of Guantanamo Bay were labeled as unlawful combatants by US Defense Forces. The Geneva Convention provides protection to all persons captured in an international armed conflict, even if they are not entitled to prisoners of war status. A series of legal memoranda arguing that the Geneva Conventions did not apply to detainees from the Afghanistan war were written in late 2001 and early 2002 by the Justice Department which helped to build the framework for circumventing international law restraints on prisoner interrogation. This was in pursuit to provide flexibility to US in the war against terrorism. The characterizations of detainees were modified as per the need of administrative purpose. Although the commander of DOD Criminal Investigative Task Force was directed to prohibit the agents from participating in interrogations that employed any questionable techniques, 
and to which withdraw from any environment or action which the person feels is inappropriate. The US military has openly acknowledged that many men at Guantanamo did not belong there. Several US departments and agencies in recent years have investigated the reports of detainee abuse. Apart from criminal investigation, several detainee interviews were also held. However, no one has been persecuted for their involvement in the abuse at Guantanamo. In December 30, 2005, Detainee Treatment Act came into force as an outcome from widespread criticism at home and abroad. The act was the first legislation to concern with the prisoners of Guantanamo. The UN report concluded that the US should close Guantanamo detention facilities without further delay. The UN investigators in their report concluded that the certain acts carried out by the US in Guantanamo amounted to torture. On 7th January 2011, President Obama signed the 2011 Defense Authorization Bill, which in part placed restrictions on the transfer of Guantanamo prisoners to the mainland or to foreign countries, thus impending the closure of the facility. In February 2011, US Secretary of State Robert Gates said that Guantanamo Bay was unlikely to be closed due to opposition in the Congress. Congress particularly opposed moving prisoners to facilities in the United States for detention or trial. As of May 2014, 149 detainees remained at Guantanamo. Friends, let us now discuss the Abu Ghraib prison. A series of human rights violations was committed against the detainees in the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq by the US Army and Central Intelligence Agency during the war in Iraq 2003. The leaked photographs illustrated the twisted reality of detention centers in Iraq and the humanity that had crept into everyday operations. These operations and interactions with the Iraqi government were emphasized. Reports of mistreatment of Abu Ghraib prisoners have primarily described the behavior of guards instructed to soften up the prisoners pending interrogation rather than abuse them during interrogation themselves. The so-called torture memos prepared by the Justice Department and approved by the White House Legal Counsel consists of policy advice regarding the avoidance of prosecution in introducing interrogation tactics tantamount to torture. On November 14, 2006, legal proceedings invoking universal jurisdiction were begun in Germany against Donald Rumsfeld, Alberto Gonzalez, Jan Yu, George Tenet and others for their alleged involvement in prisoner abuse under the command responsibility. In June 2014, the U.S. Court of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia found that an 18th century law known as Alien Tort Statute allowed non-U.S. citizens access to U.S. courts for violations of the Law of Nations or a Treaty of the United States. This would enable abused Iraqis to fight suit against suit. This would enable abused Iraqis to file suit against contractor CSEI International. Employees of CSEI International are being accused of encouraging torture and abuse as well as taking part in it as the four Iraqis contend that they were repeatedly shot in the head with a taser gun, beaten on the genitals with a stick and forced to watch the rape of female detainee during their time at the prison. Friends, let us now examine the physical and psychological elements of torture. On their initial arrest, the detainees were not always informed why they were arrested. They were detained in the cold cells. During interrogations, they were hooded and cuffed and sometimes stripped naked. 
they were beaten and even shocked by an electric baton. Few of them died because of the pain. In its February 2004 report, the ICRC found that methods of physical and psychological coercion were used by the military intelligence in a systematic way to gain confessions and extract information. The methods cited by the ICRC included hooding to disorient and prevent detainees from breathing freely, being forced to remain from, for prolonged periods in painful stress positions, being attached repeatedly over several days for several hours each time to the bars of cell doors, naked or in positions causing physical pain, being held naked in dark cells for several days and paraded naked, sometimes hooded or with women's underwear over their heads, sleep, food and water deprivation, prolonged exposure while hooded to the sun during the hottest time of the day. The classified investigative military report of Major General Antonio Taguba reported and catalogued the abuses like punching, slapping and kicking detainees, jumping on their naked feet, videotaping and photographing naked male and female detainees, forcibly arranging detainees in various sexually explicit positions for photographing, forcing groups of male detainees to masturbate themselves while being photographed and videotaped, arranging naked detainees in a pile and then jumping on them, positioning a naked detainee on a box with a sandbag on his head and attaching wires to his fingers toes and penis to stimulate electric torture, writing I am a rapist on the leg of a detainee, alleged to have forcibly raped a 15 year old fellow detainee and then photographing him naked, placing a dog chain or strap around a naked detainee's neck and having a female soldier pose with him for a picture a male military police guard having sex with a female detainee. The report did not term the abuse as rape, although the act was forcible. Breaking chemical lights and pouring the phosphoric liquid on detainees. Threatening detainees with a loaded 9 mm pistol. Pouring cold water on naked detainees beating detainees with a broom handle and a chair, threatening male detainees with rape, allowing a military police guard to stitch the wound of a detainee who was injured after being slammed against the wall in his cell, sodomizing a detainee with a chemical light and perhaps a broomstick using military working dogs without muzzles to frighten and intimidate detainees with threats of attack and in at least one case biting and severely injuring a detainee, forcing detainees to remove their clothing and keeping them naked for several days at a time, forcing naked male detainees to wear women's underwear taking pictures of dead Iraqi detainees. The cruelties of the detention also lead to some detainees to commit suicide. On 12th January 2005, the New York Times reported on further testimony from Abu Gharib detainees, which include urinating on detainees, pounding wounded limbs with metal batons, pouring phosphoric acid on detainees and tying ropes to the detainee's legs or penises and dragging them across the floor. Friends, let us now examine the legal issues involved. The abuses at Abu Gharib were not initially acknowledged by the Bush administration. The US armed forces have devoted considerable energy over the years to making the Geneva Conventions fully operational by military personnel in the field yet 
in 2004, U.S. Defense Secretary stated that the Geneva Conventions did not apply precisely in Iraq, but were basic rules for handling prisoners. The abuses were not a result of breaking of rules by the individual soldiers, but that of decisions by the administration trying to cast aside and ignore the rules. The states, through their legal memos, advocated that the long-standing legal restrictions on interrogation and treatment of detainees were obsolete in pursuit to win the war against terrorism. They sought to redefine the rights of detainees in an armed conflict. They began to employ coercive methods designed to soften up detainees for interrogation. These techniques inflicted pain and humiliation to the detainees. The administration officials had turned a blind eye to the reports of detainees until the photographs of the abuses in Abu Ghraib were published. The international organizations such as International Committee of the Red Cross and Human Rights Watch considered the acts to be a gross violation of the international humanitarian law with respect to treatment of the detainees. Irrespective of their status as prisoners of war, the detainees are provided with protection of basic human rights under the international laws, specifically the Geneva Conventions. Such protections include the right to be free from coercive interrogation, to receive a fair trial if charged with a criminal offence, and in the case of detained civilians, to be able to appeal periodically the security rationale for continued detention. In 2005, the United Nations stated the practice by US was unlawful and not man mandated by UN resolutions. The US Supreme Court in Hamdan versus Rumsfeld, as we have already discussed earlier, ruled that common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions applied to all detainees in the war on terror. In 2013, Associated Press stated that Angelity Holdings of Chantilly, Virginia paid $5.28 million in a settlement to 71 former inmates held at Abu Ghraib and other US detention sites between 2003 and 2007. With this, we come to the conclusion of this module, friends. I thank you for your patient hearing.